origins of the Westland Wasp lie in the late 1950s with the Army's need for a larger and more powerful replacement for the piston-engined Skeeter and the Navy's requirement for a light helicopter capable of operating from small ships. Powered by a gas turbine engine developed by the Blackburn Engine Company, the P-531, designed by Ted Siastula at Saunders Row, was developed in parallel for both the Army and the Navy. The dear old P-531, three of them were taken on by the Royal Navy who began to operate them off small ships to get some sense of what they were up against in operating in high seas off small ships. The pioneering nature of these extensive sea trials cannot be underestimated. The engineers, pilots and test crews pushed the boundaries of helicopter operation, working from decks not much bigger than the helicopters themselves. And you appreciate it. it isn't just a question of being able to land the thing on the deck, it's been a question of being able to hang it, work on it, range it for flight. So there was a lot to learn about ship operation, which the P-5-1 taught them. Now the other thing was the undercarriage configuration. We weren't really sure what undercarriages were best for the deck landing. So the first thing to concern ourselves with was to design an undercarriage that would actually take the impact. Further trials with a land-based moving test deck took place at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, Bedford. After numerous different schemes were tested, the four-wheeled specialised undercarriage was finally chosen. The undercarriage configuration is such that you could put the wheels um, 45 degrees towed in at the front and 45 degrees towed out at the back, which made the undercarriage describe a circle. So sat on the back of your ship, you'd be hooked onto the deck by a thing called a swivel. Um, you could release your wheel locks and then turn the aircraft into the relative wind, release the swivel, go flying from an interwind position. The WASP first flew in October 1962 and ushered in a new era of shipborne helicopter operations. The WASP was fundamentally a weapon delivery system. It was capable of carrying two homing torpedoes. Up until that time, anti-submarine protection was dealt with by the ship itself, actually firing depth charges out over the, over the side or launching homing torpedoes. If you could actually carry that torpedo away from the ship, and get it put down to another spot, you were much more capable of containing a nuclear submarine. It was beautiful. I could do that 100 miles from the ship, 100 miles from the little fleet we were in. We could use Nimrod information with sonar boys. Um, we could do all sorts of things. Very, very flexible, and it added hugely to the, to the operational effectiveness of even small ships. The WASP was the pioneer of small ship operations. You know, we have to remember uh, before this time you were really only operating helicopters and fixed wing aeroplanes from the big carriers. And to operate a helicopter from the back of a small frigate at sea in the North Atlantic in the middle of winter was, was quite an achievement. When the weather was rough and you were heavy, um, it was never terribly easy. Um, night particularly, raining. I can remember quite a few times when you were launching with a couple of torpedoes to go off on some spurious mission, killing imaginary submarines. And the whole thing was, was very much um, on the edge. You, you didn't have to do too many things wrong and, and you, would have, you would have gone into the water. If there was a drawback to the WASP, it was its propensity for seawater. And it used to try and uh, fall in the sea as often as it could, uh, certainly in the early days. Well, as you can appreciate, flying single-engine helicopters over water, you're constantly aware of the fact that the engine might stop and you're going to find yourself with a very close relationship to the sea. One of the things we had to develop, of course, was this rather elaborate flotation gear. Now, you can appreciate a little helicopter like this weighing something like two tonnes isn't going to stay afloat for very long on its own volition. So the flotation gear was designed to actually hold the aircraft up long enough for you to actually get out. Now, you had to be fairly patient, of course, and wait for the thing to fill up. Then you could punch out these, these roof um, panels and go out through the top. The flotation gear that you can see here um, is so designed that it actually, with the wasp f floating head down, the water is over the pilot's heads whilst the passengers in the back uh, can keep their head above water. Consequently, when we went to war in 1982, uh, we were looking for things to take off the helicopter and the first thing I chose to take off it was this flotation gear weighing three or four hundred pounds which we were then able to carry just that little bit of extra fuel. In fact, about an extra 20 minutes worth. The WASP had by this time been fitted with air-to-surface missiles to counteract the threat from the fast-moving Soviet OSA patrol craft, whose Styx missiles were more than capable of knocking holes in any warship. So the WASP again, was its role was changed slightly 
and the French AS-12 missile was added to the armament and we had two of these which they were originally designed to hit a tank at 7,000 metres. The missile itself was wire guided, uh, that is to say that uh, there was a very thin wires going from the aircraft to the missile which controlled its trajectory. Um, that was controlled through um, a small uh, lever here and you literally used the periscope sight to keep yourself on target and with my right hand on the lever accurately guide the missile onto the target. Boom. And in fact, the only time this was ever used in anger was against the Argentine submarine, the Santa Fe, which was actually on the surface at the time. And uh, they used a wasp to disable it enough so that it couldn't uh, submerge and get away. I was scrambled from breakfast, uh, and David Wells, my observer, and I ran down, jumped in the wasp and got airborne. And we spotted the Santa Fe on the surface and opened up with our first missile attack. David was an extremely good uh, weapons aimer and the very first missile ever fired in anger by the Royal Navy was actually a strike. Um, unfortunately the submarine uh, sail or um, conning tower uh, was, had been changed to fiberglass and there was barely enough um, resistance to get the missile to explode on impact but the subsequent ones did actually do their damage. We fired six in all nipping back to mother each time to rearm and get airborne again. One of the few wasps in flying condition is part of the Kennet Aviation Collection, owned by ex-US Navy pilot Tim Manor. He was the first person to put the wasp on the UK Civil Register. One of the most difficult things about flying these ex-military airplanes is keeping them flying. It's not as difficult to fly them it is to keep them in the air. But we've got a team of engineers that are absolutely spectacular. I'm incredibly fortunate to have them with me. They take a tremendous amount of pride in keeping them flying and uh, they're as disappointed, if not more than I am, when something breaks or something goes wrong. If an airplane doesn't make an air show or doesn't get up for a sortie, I mean, those guys just drop everything and go to work and getting it back in the air. The relatively small team of engineers we've got here at Canada's Aviation are almost exclusively ex-service. Uh, I think that's quite important when it comes to restoring these old aircraft because we have the background of operating military aircraft in a military environment. And although they're not in a military environment anymore, we still regard them as military aircraft. As an engineer, the WASP is actually very easy to work on. The engine is totally exposed. So in terms of engineering access, they don't come much better than the WASP. It's back to classic engineering. There's no magic black boxes, there's no fly-by-wire, there's no built-in computerised test equipment. It's, it's roll your sleeves up, get your spanners out of your box and go and fix it, which is great fun. John Beatty, a former commando pilot and WASP instructor, knows more than most the limits of the aircraft and thrills crowds at air shows with his flying display. I do, I do enjoy flying it. It's a nice, it's got a nice feel to it. Um, the aeroplane trims out beautifully and you can fly, not hands off, but you can fly pretty much without putting too much effort into it. It's got powered controls. Yeah, it's, 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 it's good. Doing displays are great. I'm not as avid a display pilot as some by any stretch of the imagination, but I really enjoy displaying the helicopters. It's a very exhilarating feeling. Uh, the fact that you can spin and turn and flip them around, it's, uh, it's quite unique. I fly this in the summer months, probably between April and uh, October, two or three times a week at a minimum. If they just sit in a hangar, it's the worst thing for them. The seals get dry, they start to leak, you, know, you get corrosion on things that don't move. Airplanes are meant to fly. You know, if keep things moving, keep them in the air, they're happy. There are plenty of airframes around which are kept in superb condition in, in museums, and in private collections. Um, for me, that's two thirds of the part of the restoration. The aircraft were designed and were built 
to fly. I love it. Uh, when, when we can roll an airplane out, out of the hangar that hasn't seen the light of day or had air under its wheels for 15, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, it's a real thrill. And uh, uh, it's every bit as much a thrill as doing an air show, and I think even actually more, far more. Every frigate in the Navy, and there were at one stage about 45, frigate and destroyer, had a WASP. It was the first shipboard helicopter designed specifically for that role. Um, there are others now, um, but it was the first one. And I think in, that, in, in those terms, it's a classic. They were very happy times. It was a delight to fly. And uh, yes, I think uh, I'm delighted that we managed to keep some examples left. But there aren't that many of them flying. They're, um, they're fairly unique. Uh, there are lots of Spitfires in the world, there are lots of Mustangs in the world, and thank God there are. I'm really happy to see that. But I like to see airplanes that aren't as common around, and I think the public likes to see that as much too.